Um, thank you so much. I, I can't think of a better way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm elated to be here. Um, I'm a lot, lifelong horsewoman. Uh, my husband's family has been here in Middle Tennessee for over 200 years. My family first came here over 200 years and moved around the world with the, serving the U.S. Army. Um, I, mean, I am a Tennessean. As I sit here, I look out at my barn where uh, Jan's high school member lived for a while after he was rescued. Those god-awful, horrendous, stinking stacks came off his feet in my barn while my other horses stood nearby and watched. I've been active protesting um, Tennessee Big Lick cruelty for more years than I can remember. I've protested from the White House to uh, Tennessee State Capitol, Tennessee State Fair, small towns throughout Tennessee. Um, I, I'm glad we're here at this, at this juncture in time. I do know um, from my friends around the world whom I've come to know uh, with Cadillac, and we are, we speak different languages. We have different, uh, different principles on many things. One thing we all agree on, especially my friends here in Tennessee, we cross the aisle, we shake hands. We believe in the vision of Americans who support a shared vision of the goodness that is America. When we gather in Cadillac, we, we honor the heritage that we have as Americans. One of the things that is essential to us as Americans is taking care of the weakest among us. That includes uh, our animals. We've fought long and hard, and we have managed to bring this to the finish line here, y'all, and I'm so proud of this. When I protested at Shelbyville, we have seen that attendance just plummet. And I can think of all the women, mostly women and men, we stood and sweated in the hot Tennessee sun. Uh, some of us would like, please, to have a little clarification, just so we can all know why y'all have brought us here to the table now so that we can listen to the conversations at the table. Um, could you please clarify for us all, uh, wherever we are around the world, uh, wherever we are on this issue, but why reaching an agreement at this particular point in time is in the best interest of our beloved Tennessee walking horse. Could you just clarify that for us, please? Why, why now? Thank you. Yes, thank, can you address that? Yeah, thank you for that question. A very, very well, well framed and set up. The reason is the Congress has a two-year session. Uh, we're at the end of that session. We just had an election. The Congress is going to be in for what's called a lame duck session for just a few weeks. The Congress resets in January. That means that everything that was done prior goes to zero. So the House vote that we spent so much time and energy working to secure, getting 290 co-sponsors, we have to start from ground zero again, from zero, that we've got to get that 290, and then we face in the United States Senate, if we have a bill that the industry will not support at all, we face absolute blocking maneuvers by Senator McConnell and the other senators from Kentucky and Tennessee. So we have zero chance to pass something in the United States Congress. Now, in these next three weeks, we have a chance to pass a bill that the industry has now finally supported. After you and so many other protesters and so much pressure from lawmakers have gotten the industry to the point where it recognizes that the big lick can no longer continue. Now, they want to transition their industry, and they want to preserve the show horse, you know, segment and circle to a degree, but they have agreed to end the use of chains and roller devices and, and other action to, rollers and action devices. They've agreed to shrink the size of the shoe dramatically. They've agreed to felony level penalties. They've agreed to eliminate an industry self-regulation program. They've agreed to ban the tail braces. They've agreed to have a possession ban on croton oil and salicylic acid, acid and mustard oil. They've agreed to eliminate distracting devices. 
So the question is whether you think that 70% or 90% or 110% of the past act, we can secure that 70, 90, or 110% now and have a statute on the books by January. And if there are reformers out there who want to introduce something new, that's what the lawmaking process permits. You know, when we banned the interstate transport of dogs and roosters for fighting purposes in 2002 in the U.S. Congress, it was a tough fight. You wouldn't think it was a tough fight, but it was a tough fight. Now, someone would have said, well, you didn't have a spectator ban. You didn't ban the sale of the cockfighting implements. That's true. We didn't. But we got as much as we possibly could. And then in the future, we built on those prohibitions. Now we have an incredible animal fighting statute that creates felony level penalties. That alone warrants our support of this measure. To have felony level penalties for a new federal crime of soaring. We are banning soaring. We're taking the exact definition from the past act on soaring. And we're making it a felony. And then we're also getting the chains and the tail braces out of there entirely. And we're reducing the stack. Now, the only, you know, the only folks I'm thinking who would not agree that this is a good idea are people who don't understand the legislative process. We've stated, and it's without dispute, that Senator McConnell is going to block the past act in 2021, 2022, and beyond. So we have a binary choice. We have this or we have nothing. And you might say, well, there's a rulemaking that can be done because the Obama-Biden administration pushed it. We pushed them to do that. And it was stymied by the Trump administration. Well, a rulemaking is a derivative of a statute. You can only go so far as the statute permits or is legally assailable from that point. You cannot increase the penalties. You cannot increase the authorization. We're going to quadruple the enforcement budget. We're going to get one of the key elements of the agreement, which is banning the action devices, which is why they injure the pastures of the horse with chemicals and otherwise. We're going to reduce the shoe, and then we're adding additional elements. I mean, to me, this is the biggest no-brainer that exists in terms of a deal-making exercise. And if, and if animal groups do not support this, it is on their conscience that these practices are going to persist because it does not take a PhD in political science to know that the United States Senate is not going to move this. You have 52 co-sponsors in this Congress. It hasn't moved one inch. We had 60 co-sponsors in previous Congresses. It didn't move one inch. It has no prospect for success. None. And we've got something we can get done in the next three weeks if the animal welfare community gets behind it. So thank you for your question. Yes, Clint. I want to thank Ms. Gray for calling in. She speaks for so many of the ladies who stood in the 90 degree heat. She had a great question. Um, I'm, more, I'm interested in what's in the best interest of the Tennessee walking horse. Jim Dice Glimmer, is about the most important living creature in my life. I don't have a pet, but Glimmer has been, he's, a, he's just a great, that's the Papa Charcoal of today, uh, Scott. Uh, Joe Tidings passed the Horse Protection Act by taking the senators out in the parking lot and letting them see a, an abused horse named Papa Charcoal. They went back in and they passed it along with Howard Baker's support. Glimmer is 2020 Papa Charcoal. Glimmer has been seen millions of times. He tells the complete story of the animal cruelty. Ms. Gray act took care of him for three weeks for us. Uh, and the Channel 4 came down and did the thing, which has seen the, the program on his life, 500,000 views. So she has made the case, and Mr. Pacella uses those expensive words, uh, but, uh, but he knows what he's talking about. And he drove nails with what he said. What he said is you either do this deal or you don't get a deal, and then you butt your head against the wall. I don't want to butt my head against the wall. I want to wrap these folks up. Now, I want to see no two-year-olds being shown. That's one issue. I want to see, um, and Ms. Benefield touched upon it, if the shoe can't be removed when the horse comes up to inspection, we don't have anything. So what she's talking about, the scar rule, 
we got to have that shoe where it can be removed. In fact, ideally, the horse trainer will bring that package up in one hand with the horse barefoot, essentially. So that's the key thing. But Ms. Gray, thank you for chiming in. Thank you for contributing. Thank you so much.